chapter 4. Would you stand to your feet as I read verses 38 to 44 of our scripture today? 2 Kings. It's also on the screen and in your bulletin. When Elisha returned to Gilgal, there was a famine in the land. As the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, he said to his servant, put on the large pot and boil stew for the sons of the prophets. Then one went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered from it in his lap full of wild gourds and came and sliced them into the pot of stew. For they did not know what they were. So they poured it out for the men to eat. And as they were eating of the stew, they cried out and said, O man of God, there is death in the pot. For they were unable to eat. But he said, Now bring meal. He threw it into the pot and said, Pour it out for the people that they may eat. Then there was no harm in the pot. Now a man came from Belshazzar and brought the man of God bread for the first fruits, from the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in his sack. And he said, give them to the people that they may eat. His attendant said, what will I set this before a hundred men? And he said, give them to the people that they may eat, for thus saith the Lord, they shall eat and have some left over. And so he set it before them, and they ate and had some left over, according to the word of the Lord. Father, take the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart and make them acceptable to you and beneficial to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A pastor went to visit one of his parishioners, a very elderly lady, and he just wanted to minister to her in this final season of life. And so he went to her home and was welcomed in by this elderly church member. She welcomed him in and had him sit in the living room. And they began to chat. Situated before him on a little table was a bowl of peanuts. He asked his host, these peanuts sure look good. Would you mind if I, I had some? Oh, she said, absolutely not. Feel free. And so as they talked, he would pick up a peanut or two here or a peanut or two there. And after he'd been there for 30 or 40 minutes, he noted that he had eaten virtually all the peanuts. And so he said to his elderly host, I am so sorry. I've been talking and enjoying our conversation so much, I've almost eaten up all of your peanuts. Oh, she said, well, that's really okay. Um, I haven't been able to to eat peanuts since I lost my teeth, so now I just suck the chocolate off of them and leave them in the bowl. <laughs> Sometimes you don't know what you're eating. <laughs> Such is the case in our passage today. We're told in verse 38 that Elijah, Elisha returns to Gilgal to be with the sons of the prophets. Gilgal was where the seminary was, if you will, for training the prophets. It was there where the school of the prophets was located. It was there where they would be prepared for the prophetic ministry that they were being called to and 
Elisha is like the president or the chancellor of the school, you would say today. His job would be to equip the sons of the prophets in order to fulfill their responsibilities prophetically. It was very important for him to be there because we're told in verse 38 that there was a famine in the land. That means there wasn't food. A famine meant that the agricultural industry, since it was an agrarian people, they lived off of the land, was not producing many vegetables and fruits for the people to be sustained and survived. Well, that was only because there wasn't enough rain to saturate the earth for the seeds to grow to produce the food that the people needed to be satisfied and sustained with. So there was a famine in the land. Now, why does the author of the book of Kings want to tell you that there was a famine in the land? The reason he wants to tell you that is because of why there was a famine in the land. You see, God told his people, if you depart from me and go after other gods, I will close up the heavens and there will be no rain. He told them in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 24, if you leave and walk away from me and my word, and chase other gods, your ground will become like iron and things will not be able to grow. To put it another way, when you walk away from me, you will be famished. There will be a famine in the land when you leave me, my word, and chase after other gods. So the reason that there was an agricultural famine is because there had been, it had been preceded by a spiritual departure. Because the spiritual was not being handled correctly, the agricultural was in trouble. The reason why Elisha goes to the school of the prophets is that it was the job of the prophets to explain to the people the spiritual reasons for their social dilemma, their agricultural dilemma, their economic dilemma. Because the people would not automatically make the connection between no food and their relationship with God. They are just seeing it's not raining. They're just seeing stuff is not growing. They're just seeing we are hungry and they're seeing their socio-economic, agrarian, agricultural reality, but not the spiritual cause of it. You find them in verse 38, it says, sitting before Elisha. They're in school. He's the professor. They are the students. They're in the classroom, seated before him, because his job was to equip them to deliver to the people the spiritual cause for their social chaos. And their chaos was a famine in the land. Uh, there is a famine in the land. What you are seeing on CNN and MSNBC and Fox News and Dallas Morning News and, and, and all of this chaos you are seeing has to do with a famine in the land. Now, how do you know when you're in a famine? You are hungry and nothing you do satisfies. So you know you're, you're, you're in a famine when you are hungry and you can't get what you need to fix the hunger you possess. You look at all the time and the money and the meetings and the efforts and the gatherings and the complaints and the fights and the marches and the reactions and the reactions and nothing seems to satisfy. Nothing seems to work. Nothing seems to fit or to fix the dilemma because there has not yet been made the correlation 
between our social, economic, familial, personal starvation and the spiritual departure from God that has affected and infected our lives and our culture. And until that connection is made, you stay hungry. Hungry for peace. Hungry for productivity. Hungry for harmony. Hungry for unity. Hungry for oneness. Hungry for order. Hungry for a society that is not in decline. You wind up socially starving to death. And the thing about it is, if the connection is not made, there is nothing that will satisfy. Oh, you can come up with something in the meantime that gives you a temporary fix only to discover it doesn't last very long. Now it's been a while, it's been a minute since I've been engaging myself in the local donut shop. It's been a minute. So I figured I deserve me. I deserve, after all this time not bypassing the donut shop, I deserve me some glazed donuts. So I went by the other day, the local donut shop, and I asked her for a donut or two. Or three. I asked her to give me a twister and a glaze and one of them round things that cinnamon roll. Because I, I thought I was do that after all this time that I I had been staying away from them. And, and since I was there, I told her to warm them up. Because that's a different kind of donut when you warm it up. So she put it in the microwave for 30 seconds or so. I mean, it, it just melted in my mouth. But I noticed something. And that is, as wonderful as it tasted, it wasn't long before I was hungry again. Because while it tasted good, it did not satisfy my nutritional need. And what's happening today is people are looking for some sugar to taste some answers. But it's not satisfying what's really wrong in our lives, in our world, and in our culture. Because there's a famine in the land. And until the cause is addressed, the cure cannot be experienced. And it's because of this famine that the prophets were being prepared to take the spiritual and the supernatural into the natural because that would be the only way people would ever eat. People would ever see heaven open, rain fall, the earth flourish, so there would no longer be a famine. And so, in order to prepare the sons of the prophets, whose job it would be to give God's prophetic word to the people to bring them back spiritually so that the famine could end, he had to make sure they were fed. Because if you're not fed, you can't do much feeding. Since their job was to feed the people, Elisha had to make sure they were fed. The problem had occurred in the culture of idolatry, the departure from the true God to false gods. Remember, an idol is any noun, person, place, thing, or thought that becomes your source. One set, whatever that is, is your source, is your God. We have designer gods in America. We have people who've made their race their God. 
their money their God, their politic their God, because it is their source. Whatever your source is, is your God. And they had traded it in for an idol that could not, see when they looked to idols, they looked to idols to meet needs, to make it rain, to bring fertility to the earth. They were looking for idols to do something. An idol is like dating an image. It's like going on a date with a picture of your boyfriend rather than your boyfriend. <laughs> no girlfriend, it's, it's dating an image. So they had turned from the true and living God to illegitimate sources to get their needs met. Whenever you do that, with whom you do that, you have now developed an idol, which means the true God steps away. And you wind up starving to death. One of the biggest idols of our day is religion. We've got more churches than ever, more books than ever, more programs than ever, more, more activities than ever, and more starving people than ever. Because even religion, void of God, will leave you as a hungry saint. So even the sons of the prophets are hungry. So Elijah just says, we've got to feed these guys. He tells his servant to make a stew. To make a stew so that the sons of the prophets could eat. But in verse 39, one of the guys gets a bright idea. It says he went out into the field and gathered herbs found a wild vine, gathered them in his lap, the wild gourd, sliced them, put it in the stew, for they did not know what they were. So Elisha said, make a stew. He says, I want to sweeten the pot. I want to put some stuff in the stew to juice it up. I want to put something in the stew to add a little more flavor. So he goes out into the field and he finds a wild vine. And he picks from the wild vine wild gourds. Now a gourd is basically a cucumber. But a wild gourd is a cucumber with poisonous pulp. So the poison is inside the gourd that looks like a cucumber. So you think it's a cucumber when it's actually poison. But it doesn't look like poison. It doesn't sound like poison. It's growing like it's not poison. Because that's because he couldn't see what was inside of it. He could only see the outside look and it looked like it would make the stew better. So he comes and according to the scripture, he chops it up and he puts it in the stew. When he puts it in the stew, verse 40, they poured it out for the men to eat. And as they were eating the stew, they cried out and said, Oh man of God, there is death in the pot. And they were unable to eat. In other words, food poisoning set in. And they got sick as a dog. There is death in the pot. Now, Wait a minute. The purpose of the stew was to feed the prophets so they could be healthy to get the work done in a time of famine. But because somebody had a bright idea to go out and find something that looked good in the broader field, bring it, chop it up, and mix it with the stew, that what they put in it contaminated it. Now watch this. The poison pulp from the wild cucumber did not override the stew. Oh, oh excuse me. 
it overrode the stew. The stew didn't override it. In other words, the whole stew got contaminated and everybody who ate from it got contaminated. So the men said there's death in the pot. Where am I going with this? <laughs> Whenever you go out to the world to get poisonous ideas, poisonous worldviews, through poisonous people who look good, it looks like it ought to work. It looks like it ought to fit. It looks like it'll make my life better. It looks like it'll heal my, my depression, my struggles. It looks like it's going to strengthen me. And we chop it up and we mix it with the truth of God's word. We bring the ideas of the world into the church, the ideas of the world into our lives, and we mix it with the word of God. It's not that we deny the word, it's that we mix it with wild gourds. And when you mix God's truth with wild gourds, it contaminates the truth. So that the truth that was supposed to set you free winds up killing you because it has been contaminated with something that it cannot accept. The Bible says that you do kill the word with your ideas. Whenever you bring thoughts, concepts, and ideas and mix them with God's truth, when they are not consistent with God's truth, you are killing yourself. So what we are seeing in our culture and in our lives today is an illegitimate mixture. We go to our colleges and universities, we pick up poisonous ideas in the name of making money, stir it into a little church, because we think somehow if we can mix it, even though it contradicts it, it'll make us better, more profitable, it'll make us more successful, and we wind up wanting to know, even with our degrees, why am I dying? Why can't I keep my life together? Why, why is that? A, with all these educated people out here, they ought to be able to figure a way for all of us to get along. How come all these smart people with all these brilliant ideas and with all this money and all this education can't heal this land that's falling apart because they got poison in the stew? And when you have an illegitimate mixture of God's way and the world's way of human wisdom with divine wisdom, whenever you bring those two together, you cancel out God. God can be canceled by the wrong combination. So they bring in this pulp and he says, this wild gourd, it's adding something to God which he has not approved or prescribed because it looks good. That's false religion. It looks good. It sounds good. It says they ate it, and they said, we cannot, we're gagging here. We're, 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 we're gagging here on this mixture. You can't mix. If you, if you mix diesel and unleaded, you ain't going nowhere. <laughs> Oil and water are not designed to mix. They're two different worlds. And that's what the Bible calls double-mindedness. You're going, you're going both ways and you're trying to mix the two together. When something contradicts God, that's why the Bible says you can neither take away from my word nor can you add to my word. And then the Bible says if you take away from it or if you illegitimately add to it, you add a curse to yourself. Because God is smart enough not to need your help. And so, they said, we can't eat this. Well, now we got a problem. Because if the preachers can't even eat it, 
how are they going to help the folks to know how to eat? If the, if the, if the folks who are supposed to be giving you the word of God are mixing it, if they are taking from the world and trying to give you hell's answer to help heaven out, And how can the sons of the prophets be of any benefit to the people who are gagging because of the absence of truth? False religion is turning to illegitimate outside sources that contradict God's truth and you stay in a famine. There is no solution to what you're seeing happening in our cities and our culture and our country and our lives as long as the spiritual is either marginalized or illegitimately mixed. Any of you ever have folk who uh, walk across your lawn, your green grass, they just walk across your lawn regularly, just kids like to do that. They just, in the name of a shortcut. They're walking across your lawn in the name of a shortcut. So what they're doing is they're killing the path of grass. They're killing the path of grass. What they're doing is they're creating an illegitimate path to a destination. People are regularly cutting across God's truth with illegitimate additions trying to get to a destination. And they wonder why they're hungry, why they can't be satisfied, satisfied with peace and order and productivity and meaning because there has been an illegitimate addition. So Elijah's got to resolve this problem with the sons of the prophet whose job it is to bring the nation back to God. So in verse 41, Elijah says, Bring me meal. Bring me meal. Meal is flour. Flour. Bring me meal. They bring the flour to him. He throws it into the pot and says, pour it out for the people that they may eat. Then there was no harm in the pot. Ooh, interesting. Here's the problem. The problem is that the mixture has now already occurred. The pulp, poison pulp is already in the stew. And there is no way to get the poison out of the stew because it's, it's already been mixed up. You got anything going on in your life that you, you, you can't fix it because it's, it, it, you're too messed up. It's just, it's just all up in your stuff. It's just all up in, it's, it's integrated itself into the fibers of your life and you don't know how to separate it and you can't separate it because it's, it's already in the stew of your existence. How do I unwrap myself out of this situation by either me putting the poison pulp in or allowing somebody else to put the poison pulp in and now it's then situated itself in the stew of my life and I and I can't I can't live, I can't eat, I can't function like I'm supposed to function because I got I got I, I got death in the pot and the pot is my life or my family or my culture. It's already stirred up in there. It's been in there for a long time. And the racial problem has been going on for 240 years and the class problems and the cultural problems and it's just all mixed up and you got philosophies and theologies and theories and you got personalities and histories and backgrounds and you got all this stuff going on and it's all just all mixed up in there and you don't know what people's motives are and you don't even know what your own motives are and you're trying to figure out who to vote for because you don't like nobody and you're just trying to work do all that. It is all, it is all mixed up. It's all in the stoop. Elijah said, bring me flour. Now, flour was used for making bread. The primary use of flour was for bread. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. In fact, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. That's why bread shows up in the next verse. How was the problem resolved 
when the poison was already in it. Here's how it was resolved. It had to be overwhelmed by something stronger and thicker and more powerful than the poison that had been introduced to it. It had to just be overwhelmed, overcome. It had to be overcome by something that was bigger and stronger. So Elisha knew if I get the flour in there, it'll overwhelm the poison. It'll, it'll, it'll eat it up so that now the stew that was made bad can be transformed. I don't know how much poison you have in your personal life, in your world, and we see there's poison everywhere in the culture. But I do know this. This is not a time for light, mild, this is not time for Christian light. This is not a time for, for now I lay me down to sleep, pray the Lord my soul will keep. And if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul will take. No, we need some flour. That is, we need the word of God so strong, so powerfully, so purely, so uncompromisingly that it overwhelms the poison that has penetrated the life. You need more of this word to overwhelm the poison that has been in your life for days, weeks, months, and years. You say, I've been dealing with this for years. You don't have enough flour. The flour has to overwhelm the poison. We need a generation of Christians now who take the word of God seriously, who take the word of God for what it is. Not words about God, but the voice of God in print and who overwhelm our lives and our souls. There's some sitting here with poisoned souls. Your souls have been poisoned by the wrong people, the wrong circumstances, the wrong addictions, and so the poison is situated inside of you, and you live with poison. Well, then it must be overwhelmed with flour, with the bread of life, the the worse the poison is, the more of the word you need. Not the less of it, but you need it uncompromised. You, you need it, you don't need some more pulp. The more gourds, you need it uncompromised. It says, now feed them this. Overwhelm them with the flour. There was no harm in the pot. He says in verse 42, give them to the people that they may eat. Verse 43, give them to the people that they may eat. For thus saith the Lord, they shall eat and they shall have some left over. Mm. Let's follow this. There's a famine. Folk are starving. <laughs> but the only reason there's a famine is because a spiritual issue had gone unaddressed. The prophets were being prepared to declare the word of the Lord, but they had to understand how this thing works and that you cannot integrate competing ideas, poisonous ideas, well-educated poisonous ideas, rich poisonous ideas, popular poisonous idea from, from people. I mean, you look at all these reality shows and, 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 and all these counseling shows, you better check and see whether there's any poison in the pulp. Because just because they look good and stand good and talk good and, 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 and got all that going on, you better ask, is there poison in this pulp? So they, so they got, they overwhelmed it with the word. He says, now, now you eat it. It says, and then they ate. Okay, wait a minute. It was not enough that the problem was fixed. They had to eat it. 
Okay. You go to the restaurant. They hand you a menu. The menu is a written record of what the restaurant has to offer. Sometimes you salivate just by reading the menu because it just looks so good. You're going, this looks good. Sometimes you say, ooh, that looks good, that looks good, that looks good. Think I want to try that, think I want to try that. Not only do you have a menu, you get a waiter who comes over and does a menu exposition, an exegesis of the menu. They come over and they describe it and tell you what this is and tell you all about it. Then they have a Q&A session. Any questions? <laughs> so they make themselves available for Q&A so that you have clarity on what has been written for you to eat. You do not then, after reading the menu, and then after having an explanation by the waiter or waitress of the menu, get up and leave. That's not why you came. You didn't come to read about it, nor did you just come to hear somebody explain it. You came for the experience of it to be filled by it which means you have to eat. You see, a lot of folk want to come to church to read it or to hear some waiter called a preacher to explain it, but they still leave hungry because they haven't eaten it. The Word of God and its transforming flower will never change your life, your home, your church, or your society unless the folk eat it. Yeah. Jeremiah said, I ate your words, and they were like honey inside of me. They changed me. Until the word you hear is what you apply and act on, you leave the restaurant hungry and are unaffected by even showing up there. And that's why you can go to church every single Sunday. You could go 52 weeks a year, 52 Wednesdays a year, and still be in a famine. Because you didn't eat it. You observed it, you watched it, you read it, you heard it, but you never swallowed. And only by the application, acting on it. If you are right now in a famine in your life, how do you know you are eating it? Because you're going to find out everything God has to say about your problem, everything in this book about your problem. I'm, if I don't know it, I'm going to call on somebody who can show me everything God says about what I'm going through, even if I created my own poison. And then I'm going to think about it, meditate on it, and do whatever it says about it because I believe that if I eat it, I'm going to be satisfied. I'm going to be filled. I'm going to be changed. We're in a crisis. On every level. And as Hebrews 12 says, God shakes things up to get our attention. He shakes things up until you get the point. Without him, it's unfixable. And what you are seeing now in our country, our culture, in our racial relationships, the brilliant minds can't fix. Because the scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 1 Corinthians chapter 2, God makes a fool of the wisdom of this world. God will downright embarrass you by thinking you can do this without him or have to add to him to get it done right. I don't know what's getting you hungry today. But I do know where there's some food. I do know, don't know why your soul is starving today or our culture is starving today. 
But I do know where there's some flour. And it, when taken in seriously, will eat up the poison so that you can be whole again. And so that the famine is addressed. A man went to the store one day because he needed some spaghetti sauce. So he went to get spaghetti sauce and he picked up, he didn't know much about food, he picked up prego spaghetti sauce. He went to the store clerk and he said, uh, now I've got this sauce because we, we're eating spaghetti. Now where do I get the tomatoes? The store clerk said, no, no, it's, it's in there. Okay, well, now where do I go to get the oregano? Oh, no, uh, no, it's, 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 already, it's already in there. He said, well, 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 where do I go to get the, the basil? Oh, it's in there. What about the Italian sausage? It's all in there. What about the garlic? Oh, it's in there. What about, what, 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 what about all these other ingredients? It's, you're looking all out here. But what you have for what you need has already been taken into consideration and it's all in there. I don't know what you're looking for today, but if you need peace, it's in there. <laughs> if you need order, it's, it's in there. If you need justice, it's in there. If you need unity, it's all in there. If you need happiness, it's in there. If you need provision, it's in there. You go and shopping everywhere else when God is saying it's already been put in there. If you and I will take seriously the word of God, you will see when he put it together, he didn't leave any of the recipes out. Shall we stand to our feet? Right now, if you're famished in your life circumstances, if you're famished, you're starving to death because there's some poison there. There's some wild gourds growing up in your soul. Come forward, let us pray with you real quickly. Whatever that, whatever that is, we're going we're gonna to pray for you because we love you. We care